Hello and welcome to this ECSE webinar on enabling multi-node MPI parallelization of the LIS flood flood inundation model. My name is Arno Pruma and I will be telling you about this ECSE project which was done as part of the Archer service um, in collaboration with um, Declan Walters, previously of the University of Edinburgh School of Geosciences and currently at the British Geological Survey and Professor Simon Mudd um, also at the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh currently. So to set the scene and give you a bit of background and context for this project, it's really about um, the area of landscape evolution modeling. So um, we're going to have a look at what, what is the current situation with regards to landscape evolution modeling and HPC. Now, now the landscape evolution modeling community is in fact rather new to HPC, but it's still relatively new. Um, and when I, when I say landscape evolution modeling, I'm talking here specifically about the areas of geomorphology, um, including such processes as, as erosion, sedimentation, etc., cetera, um, as well as hydrology within the context of landscape evolution, namely uh, river flow um, and also flooding, the impact this has um, on short-term and long-term um, of evolution of the landscape. Now this has come to the fore um, with regards to HPC because there is a growing availability not just of uh, processing power, of course, um, but um, increasingly higher resolution data. Um, namely, what's relevant to this area is topographic data, um, such as uh, surface elevation maps, which are gener generated, for example, from LIDAR measurements. And these are reaching sub-meter resolutions, um, uh, linearly speaking. So um, the amount of, of actual uh, um, uh, uh, square surface area uh, data available is, of course, growing quadratically with that. As well as the topographic data, the other data that's increasing in resolution and thereby amount, um, probably also temporal frequency, is the weather and climate data. And this could refer to um, sense, actual sensor data, uh, for example, things such as rainfall, or of course outputs from, from other um, simulations, be they short-term weather forecasts or longer-term climate forecasts. So all of these um, uh, have become uh, you know, more available um, and are continuing to become more available and are presenting interesting opportunities to this area of landscape evolution modeling because it allows um, a much greater resolution spatially and temporally of detailed processes underlying um, landscape evolution um, and also being able to um, resolve existing processes with higher accuracy. Um, Treatment of larger domains is also, of course, uh, uh, even if resolution was not growing, leading to larger amounts of data needing to be to be um, uh, used as inputs uh, to or taken as outputs from simulation. Um, and so this this is this offers great potentials um, for work in this area, but of course also um, challenges computationally. And that's where this project comes in. Uh, one of the things, one of the big things, of course, that we would like to be able to do in particular with the kinds of simulations that are doing a short term impact forecasting from such hydrological events as flooding and flooding inundation is that we want to be able to get very quick, uh, very short time to solutions um, from these forecasts, because that is where the, the biggest impact can be had. Um, uh, from from the um, from HPC in this area. So, however, so we want to be able to do this, but uh, the the fact of the matter is that a lot of numerical landscape evolution modeling software is not really ready for prime time HPC use yet. It's mainly because there's just limited parallelization that's been implemented so far. Um, but this is a real growth area, and the project that I'm reporting on, this ECC project, is one uh, move in this direction. So the project concerns um, a particular flood risk in a flooding model called LIS flood. So LIS flood, and I'll talk about the connection to, to Caesar. It's a combined model, Caesar LIS flood. Um, it simulates, so it's a hydrodynamic model, 
uh, and it simulates flooding in river catchments and floodplains and also incorporates erosion and sediment transport processes which um, contribute to the geomorphology. And the idea is that um, within with the same model, um, you can in principle simulate uh, time scales uh, corresponding to rather short term flood events in a matter of hours, as well as uh, more uh, longer term geomorphological uh, time scales um, up to, to months and years, hundreds of years. And in fact, um, Caesar List Flood uh, stands for so. Um, um, so Caesar stands for uh, Settler Automaton Evolutionary Slope and River Model. So um, this model is uh, used in flood inundation modeling and therefore in flood risk research, which was identified by uh, NERC. Um, Natural Environmental Research Council as a strategic research area. The model was previously implemented by uh, my collaborator Declan Balters um, in the application Hail Caesar. Um, Hail Caesar stands for, so Hail stands for High Performance Architecture Independent List Flood Caesar Model. And it's available and described um, at the link given here. Now this code, this application was open to be parallelized, and um, but is, is therefore um, a limited to running on a single um, uh, compute node, or at least on a single uh, shared memory um, architecture. And the real challenge of, of this ECSE project was to somehow enable um, multi-node parallelization of Hail Caesar, uh, and to thereby uh, make a real step change in the ability to run this model on much, much, much larger HPC resources than obviously a single node. And with all the benefits that we expect to be able to get from that as, as highlighted previously with regards to uh, a shorter time to solution, vastly shorter time to solution, as well as the ability to handle uh, much larger domain sizes and much higher resolution uh, topographic um, and accompanying um, climatic uh, environmental um, uh, data. So looking at what's involved in, um, uh, in Hail Caesar in the application, um, as a starting point to, to looking at how we can parallelize um, this to run on multiple nodes, the code, um, the core of the code is highlighted in this flowchart by the gray boxes, which um, as you'll see, uh, in the description here, reflect uh, parts of the algorithm that were already parallelized using OpenMP threading. They constitute the, the core um, uh, hydrological uh, um, algorithm within the code. So the code takes in uh, a so-called DEM, or Digital Elevation Model file, which, which um, uh, is data that refers to, is a topographic data essentially, namely the surface elevation, and uses that um, combined with uh, uh, model specific parameters and um, rainfall information and sedimentation grain information to initialize the model. And the core, uh, the core hydrological um, part of the algorithm is, is the routing of the, uh, of the water flow uh, which takes place uh, both on surface and subsurface and takes into account um, things like vegetation and moisture uh, um, aspects, uh, retention aspects of the soil. So that's where the, that's where the model is really, um, that's where the parameters of the model really play, play their role. Then the water depth um, uh, over, the, over the terrain is updated. So some erosion can take place, but again, the erosion is not part of the core hydrological component of the algorithm. Uh, then there are various other processes to do with the geomorphology, like slope processes and things like that. That's the core uh, part. So for reference, I've, I've, I've put in here the reference to uh, PhD thesis by Declan, which describes um, the model and also describes the, the application and some of the results uh, of, of the research done with this application. Now, as I said, what we want to focus on here uh, in this project is first of all the core interest is um, the hydrological component of the algorithm. So it's the 
it's, it's the flooding component that we care about most uh, because that is where we expect um, uh, to, to be able to have the biggest impact from getting shorter time to solution from flood risk um, from uh, acute flood risk forecasting. So that means that we're going to focus on the flow routing and the water depth update. Uh, the water flux out is also is also also there, but less important. The erosion routines and actually any other physics that you might like to add in um, additionally on top of the hydrological component doesn't really add any fundamental complexity um, in terms of kind, but it just adds additional computational cost. Um, there, 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 are for, there are lots of um, additional functionality that could be implemented, but as I said, we're focusing here on porting the uh, or enabling multi-node parallelization for the core hydrological routines. So to say a bit more about um, Hale Caesar um, and to see what our starting point is for what we actually want to parallelize. Um, so Hale Caesar is a it's essentially a grid. It's a 2D cellular automaton automaton model. Um, and it's, a, it's essentially stencil code of which, uh, which are very common in, in HVC. So what that means is that we have um, uh, a two-dimensional grid and uh, for each cell on the grid, we have the physical quantities that we care about defined, such as the elevation and the water depth at the very least. Another uh, real value physical quantities, such as the water fluxes in and out of cells uh, that are computed as part of the algorithm. Then, Time evolution is given by a, an update rule, and it being a stencil code, what that means is that the update rule consists of computing the new value of each um, quantity for a cell, for a given cell, uh, based on purely on values of quantities in that cell and immediate neighboring cells to the east, west, west, north, and south. So in this case, the model is a simple four-point um, stencil. Uh, looking at four-point neighbor values for various physical quantities in order to compute the value of any given quantity for, for the cell that we're considering uh, for the next uh, time step. And what the underlying model, Hale Caesar, uh, what the underlying model, Caesar list flood model is actually doing, a particular list flood component, it's solving a simplified version of um, the San Vendon shallow water equations uh, for, for two-dimensional depth average flow and it calculates water discharge based on local gradients of water depth and the elevation, surface elevation of the bed um, based on the values for neighboring grid cells. And this takes to, into account uh, aspects that I already mentioned of surface and subsurface discharge of soil moisture store and all other kinds of uh, landscape evolutionary components, which um, I'm sure I know nothing about. So to put this into pictures, which are just a bit, bit, bit clear, just to, to, to know what we're talking about, actually these, these images here um, are um, synthetic, is a synth synthetic time evolution of the Hill Caesar hydrology uh, uh, algorithm. And these are actually produced not by the original Hill Caesar code, but um, by the new uh, parallelized uh, version that, um, that I produced in this, in this project. So as you can see, we're starting at we're starting at the top left corner. The top left corner is um, uh, the color code stands for the water depth. So essentially, we are initializing our system with with a water depth that is a high of some value, notional value uh, one, at the central cell within the system, and the water depth is uh, zero everywhere else. And as we go forward in time. We can see that what the algorithm is doing as we go down these pictures is that it's 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 routing the flow of the water um, and what we're doing here is we're simulating uh, a persistent rainfall on that central uh, cell so that essentially as you can see the color of that cell is always red which means that that cell is persistently held purely synthetically artificially at um, a fixed maximum water depth so that it's always continually feeding um, the cells around it, and these are continuously, continuously being forced to accept as much water as they can by the flow routing algorithm. So as you can see, that uh, the um, water spreads out. Um, there is this looks quite symmetric, but in fact, you'll start to notice here that there is a quite there's a there's a subtle east-west asymmetry here. That's because um, if we were to look at the ele elevation, the surface elevation, topographic input to this um, synthetic um, test case. 
it's not actually a flat surface. It's actually a, a gradient, east-west gradient surface. So there will be slight, there will be a slight bias in the amount of water flowing in one direction, um, um, namely more into the west or east. I'm not sure. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, so this gives you a clear picture of uh, what the flow routing algorithm is doing. That's just a picture to refer back to. So it's this. Um, so it's this synthetic test case that shows us in detail what the algorithm is doing. But of course, really, when it comes down to the actual simulations that we want to run, we're going to be looking at uh, a realistic terrain, a much, much, much larger um, varied terrain. So for example, uh, one as displayed here, which is um, still a, a, a reasonably moderate, uh, moderately sized um, 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 digital elevation model corresponds to the uh, river valency um, near the town of Boscastle in, Corn in Cornwall, which uh, suffered a flood in 2004. So this, so this has become a test case that's used um, to, to simulate the, um, uh, to, to test the model parameters against real data um, in combination with rainfall uh, date time series. Uh, so that's, that's what the simulation, simulation uh, essentially does. And the, the area, the terrain area that's spanned here is 12 square kilometers. Um, and it's with a resolution of uh, one meter squared. So just give you an idea of how many cells um, there would be in, in such a terrain. So, um, so I wanted to not not just report on on what's done in this project, but also to for the interest of um, people who might. So we have two two kinds of classes of people who might be interested in this. We have, of course, people who might be interested in actually using the model, using the the, the, the code, the software that results, as well as looking at the software development aspect. So I wanted to highlight um, both a bit, but more on the software development aspect. Um, so, the when we think about how to how to parallelize uh, this model for multiple nodes, we want to take a step back and think, okay, well, it's a stencil code and it's a regular grid. So this actually is a very well defined, a well understood class of problems, of simulations, and and parallelization approaches in general are very well established for this. Namely, you do some kind of domain decomposition. Um, where you split the, the domain up into, into, into regions and assign each re region to a, to a processor, to a core, um, and do halo exchange on the boundaries, uh, given that that is all that is needed um, with a stencil, st stencil code uh, to apply the stencil uh, between, um, between neighboring cells. So all that needs to happen there is that information needs to somehow can be communicated uh, between uh, cores that are responsible for um, uh, computing uh, the evolution within each domain. Now, this is therefore a tried and true, uh, tried and tested um, uh, approach. In principle, there's lots of variations, to, and, and especially when it comes to load balancing, as we'll see. But the the idea is, well, should you? Um, okay, so we, we can we can say that we want to do this using MPI. The title of the project is enabling multi-node parallelism using MPI. Why? Because MPI is ubiquitous on HPC machines. So clearly, this is the preferred solution um, for enabling distributed memory parallelization. Uh, and again, that's a tried and tested method. Uh, we can, of course, go ahead and implement that according to whatever uh, approach for domain decomposition we find appropriate. Uh, we have to decide what kind of domain decomposition we want to do and whether it's going to be static and whether we're going to uh, put in a dynamic uh, um, decomposition in order to take into account varying load. But really, because this is such a generic, such a well-defined uh, category of problem, we should really be able to leverage existing software solutions um, um, instead of creating a, a re-implementation or reinventing um, of the wheel. So we want to look at software reuse and especially using all the effort that might have gone into creating something that um, uh, will uh, give us a lot of flexibility and a lot of performance already uh, as, a, as a middleware layer um, from the perspective of application developer. So we're looking for something like a library or, or perhaps a domain specific language. And the considerations or requirements that we place on this um, are that, first of all, A, as I said, it should be based on whatever solution we choose. It should, it should be based, built on top of MPI. And um, we already know, actually, 
that load balancing is important, uh, not just uh, from the outset statically, but dynamically adaptive to the simulation. That is because um, even though we might look at the landscape initially and um, potentially with some knowledge that the rainfall will not exceed some certain key uh, threshold, argue that the load distribution is, is somewhat predictable based on the catchment and the, and the, and the terrain and, and the, the, the structure of the river and, and perhaps some distribution of vegetation and surface structure. But even though there might be that initial predictability, um, this can change drastically in general um, for, uh, uh, for uh, dramatic uh, rainfall conditions, and that's on the short term. And indeed, on the long term, we know that we are also considering simulations that span over geomorphological timescales. So there might be, might well be, a gradual shifting um, uh, of the of the of the flow of of uh, catchment of uh, um, and, and one part of river might. Um, uh, connect differently and a branch might disappear, a new branch might emerge so that our static load balancing uh, decomposition would no longer um, uh, perform well. So dynamic load balancing is important and we also know this from results um, that were reported in the referenced thesis that I mentioned earlier for the, um, which included open and threaded parallelization of the flow routines and that exhibited um, uh, not insignificant uh, load imbalance, which is identified as a clear problem to solve. There are multiple solutions, but the solution that we settled on uh, for this project was to make use of a library called libgeodcomp. Uh, the name already sounds suggestively good, given that we're looking at a geomorphological or hydrological uh, um, um, we're looking to decompose a geological problem or a geomorphological problem. So the, the name sounds good, but can Canada do what it want? What we wanted to do, the answer uh, we suspect, based on um, uh, the immediate appearance of what the library tells us it, it can do, is yes, namely that it is its pure goal is to focus on stencil codes. There, there is some freedom to do other kinds of codes, but the main use area is stencil codes specifically. To parallelize these within the C++ framework, okay, C++ is useful because actually Hill Caesar, as it happens, is already written in C++. Also, there are other options out there that uh, there's at least one domain-specific language option. Um, however, we might prefer a pu pure language um, C++ option because um, it would it's more easier to, to customize and extend to incorporate other kinds of physics work. So this, um, it, it also uses the Boost library. So other features of libgeodcomp um, are that um, it uses MPI. It can be, it can, um, it can be built, on, built on top of MPI, which is great. It's what we're looking for. In addition to that, it can, well, no, I shouldn't say in addition to that, because actually you have to choose when you uh, parallelize an application or, or um, uh, using libgeodcomp, you have to choose whether you're going to parallelize with MPI, with OpenMP. You can offload using CUDA to a GPU, but um, as far as I can tell, this is just to a single GPU, so that might be useful for, for a workstation, but again, not what we're interested in for HPC, um, when, if it's just a single GPU. Or indeed, um, HPX, which is an MPI alternative uh, developed by the Stellar Group, um, of which the developers of libgeodcomp um, uh, were are also uh, a member. Um, so it's based on MPI, and what it, what does it do for stencil code? It it does the domain decomposition, which is what we want. It does dynamic load balancing, and it can do these things in a very variety of ways. Um, uh, these these may mean uh, more or less to you, depending on if you're familiar with uh, load balancing and domain decomposition approaches, but supported, in principle, supported approaches include recursive bisection, uh, Hilbert and zigzag space filling curve approaches, as well as uh, graph-based partitioning based on the uh, Scotch, uh, P or PT Scotch um, libraries. Other uh, aspects um, which might convince us to use libqdcomp are that it's had a uh, Quite a bit of uh, optimization effort invested in it to do all the things that we that are, we know from a parallelization from a parallel computing perspective are good things to do if you want good parallel performance in particular latency hiding by overlapping computation and communication and um, it makes use of 
uh, a library developed by the same developers, or at least by the Stellar group called LibFlat Array, distributed as part of the LibUDCOMP um, library, incorporated within it, but also available as a standalone. And what LibFlat Array um, enables is fast iteration through arrays of structs, which are actually then under the hood stored as structs of arrays. Um, and enabling um, um, efficient factorization with instruction set specific uh, templates um, to enable fast iteration um, through these arrays of structs. Um, and these are these instructions, these templates are updated with, with um, instruction sets for, for pro, uh, newer processors um, as, as these come on the market. So already there's quite a bit of optimization work in there, which suggests that we could, we could benefit um, from, as well as the fact that we don't know actually a priori uh, what would be the best um, load decomposition or load balancing approach. And by having a variety of approaches, as mentioned, available in the library, we can, um, for any given system, um, experiment. And it might be that for short-term flood risk, um, flood modeling, uh, one particular decomposition is much more likely to be uh, relevant, whereas for our longer term geomorphological modeling, it might be that um, a different uh, decomposition, a load balancing algorithm, will perform better. So using libvudicomp um, should give us a clear win because it allows us this flexibility and allows users this flexibility. Um, other things that it has as functionality is it does MPI IO based checkpointing, which is really useful to have. Uh, it can do some parallel I.O. mainly for visualization um, in the visit brick of value, BOV formats and silo formats. And also one thing that suggests that it's used, that it's that it's um, actually usable, can actually do the job, is that it's been used on a, on a, on a number of uh, large HPC systems, um, both in Europe and the US and Japan. Um, and it's shown that it can, that it's possible to obtain good efficiency for particular problems anyway, um, on up to, up to tens of thousands of cores. So um, it sounds like it's, this is a good good thing, good good solution to use. But let's look at how um, how we can actually do this and what is the difference between the original Hail Caesar application um, and the uh, Hail Caesar libgeodecomp port that I produced. So in the original Hail Caesar implementation, um, it's very simple. So we read in elevation data, topographic elevation data from this digital elevation model file. We store elevation data and as well as um, our uh, water depth um, uh, as grids in 2D arrays of doubles. And then the list flood algorithm, the flow routing algorithm and a water depth algorithm simply loops over these arrays. And if we use the open, if we have uh, multiple cores and we have we have compiled with OpenMP turned on, then we can do these, uh, these, these um, loops um, uh, as parallel open B4 loops. And that's it. That's, that's, that's essentially, there's a lot more, there's a lot more in the code, but uh, when it comes down to the, the key hydrological components that we mentioned um, are of interest, um, that's it. So compare that um, to the libgeodecomp um, port. So there we have to uh, go through quite a few steps. So we have to define, first of all, and this is true for any um, application which you, which wants to make use of libgeodecomp, we have to define a custom cell class which defines um, the data stored, the data member types uh, for each grid cell um, on our grid. And for the hydrological components that we care about, those are again uh, for each grid cell the elevation, a single double for each grid cell, the elevation and a single double, the water depth. And additionally also things like fluxes, etc. Uh, that doesn't add any real complexity. This custom cell class must contain an update, an update function, a function called update, which is what's called by libgeodecomp during each time step. And update can itself call other functions as you, as you care to define. And if we are going to want to do something that we almost certainly always want to do, at the very least, um, to implement boundary conditions on our system, namely to distinguish between different types of cells, yeah, in fact, of course, our, our algorithm might might distinguish between different types of cells for all kinds of reasons, but at the very least, we know we have boundary conditions to take into account to at the edges of our domain. Then what we what we do that the way that is done with libgeodecomp lib typically is to have uh, an enum uh, member type for each um, uh, grid cell, which um, simply uh, uh, enumerates um, the um, 
it's, an enumer it, 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 its value is one of an enumeration of possible uh, cell types. For example, northern boundary, western boundary, corner case, etc., or whatever is relevant to the algorithm. So uh, having, having defined our custom cell class, we also need to define a custom so-called initializer class. I have spelled it here with a Z because in libraries with a Z. Um, uh, so we must this initializer class must extend a, a suitable choice of a libgeodcomp base class, base initializer class. Um, then within that initializer class, we must define a grid function. And within that grid function, we must, using libgeodcomp's um, coordinate system syntax, initialize all the grid cells all the grid cells on the entire grid, if we're talking about serial execution or if we're talking about running a parallel, then all the cells in each rank's subgrid. So the grid function is what libgeodcomp calls when um, um, it initializes uh, the, the grid as a whole or the subgrid on each rank. That's not it, because we also, what we need to do is then declare um, declare and define uh, our simulator, which is what's actually going to run the simulation. And this um, uh, is an instance of a suitable libgeodcomp uh, simulator type, such as, for example, serial, parallel, um, and uh, varieties, including different uh, decomposition approaches. And this simulator must be passed instances um, of our custom initializer, so an, an instance of our custom initializer and also an instance of a suitable so-called load balancer. So the load, so libgeodcomp defines a variety of load balancer classes and whichever load balancing uh, approach we want to use, we must define this as a load balancer and um, feed this to the simulator. Now then there's a key thing which must be done if we are running MPI parallel, which we are, which is that we must explicitly commit um, a number of MPI type maps, which define the um, uh, derived uh, data types uh, for MPI to send and receive, we must explicitly commit these to MPI com world. And I'm talking here about uh, type maps that describe the MPI derived data types within libgeodcomp itself. So actually very completely independently of whatever we decide to code, independently of our application, libgeodcomp itself. Um, has its own uh, internal um, derived types, which it need, which needs to be need to be committed to MPI com world, and this is done by calling initialize maps, or to be very careful within the within the namespace of libgeodcomp to call libgeodcomp initialize maps. In addition to this, we must also, and this is actually not at all obvious, we must also generate an MPI type map for our own uh, custom uh, cell class and commit, also commit this to MPI, MBI com world. So I'll talk a bit more about this, this key part um, in the next slide. Then finally, we must define any kind of output writers um, for visualization or otherwise, uh, or checkpointing, uh, and uh, declare these and um, associate them with our simulator, and then tell the simulator to run, uh, which will run for however many time steps we've asked it to run for, and call the update function uh, that we've defined uh, at each time step. So within our update function, clearly that's where these tensor, um, that's where the application of this tensor lies, and that's where the the flow routing um, um, algorithm is, is finds its way again. So I mentioned that um, I would describe this type map generation that's needed for whatever application you yourself have written and are trying to make make use of libgeodcomp. In other words, what I was saying is that as well as committing libgeodcomp's own type maps, you need to commit your type maps corresponding to um, the uh, members data type members of your cell class. What that means is that you must, to be able to commit these, you must first generate them, which means you must generate code, uh, source code and a header file that describe the MPI type map and that generate it. Um, for your custom cell class. Um, and this, you can't just do this any old way you like. You must do it using libgeodcomp's conventions um, in order for, for things to, to interoperate, in order for your, your cell class to interoperate with, um, 
with libgdcomp. So to do this is quite a convoluted process. What you do is um, you make sure you have Doxygen, um, the documentation generator uh, uh, software installed, and then you use it as well as scripts that are supplied by libgdcomp um, within the directory mentioned there. And you must do a variety of things. You must make sure that your cell class, which you've defined, also declares that um, it has type maps as a friend class. Then you will run Doxygen within your applications directory, which will then generate XML that describes your code. And what it will do is it will seek out uh, occurrences of uh, classes that declare themselves as being friends uh, as um, uh, being friends for type maps and um, then finally you run um, well not finally but next you run uh, a Ruby script that's included with libgeodcomp called type map generator which then parses the XML and writes out um, the source code and header files type maps .h and type of cpp which uh, follow the libgeodcomp comp internal conventions and which you can, and then you need to make sure that these are uh, included and compiled when you finally build your code um, and and that you do indeed what i mentioned on the slide before uh, commit um, co make the call to initialize those maps uh, causing them to be committed to the runtime's mpi com world as well so if you've done that, it should work, and it does work. So um, reflection on, on, on using libgeodcomp is that um, so it, it it looks like it's it's it looks like it's the right tool for the job, and it's made specifically for stencil codes, and it should give very good performance. However, from the application developer's perspective, porting a code to use libgeodcomp, uh, you encounter the fact that it is heavily templated with um, multiple layers of abstractions. So coming to libgeodcomp um, uh, without any foreknowledge, it's not easy and not quick to understand how everything fits together because there's lots of indirection and abstraction. There's an API documentation available but as a reference, but it's not a good starting point to get a real sense of how everything operates together. The most useful thing, um, as the developers also point out, uh, is that it, uh, in addition to actually just simply looking at the looking at the code and trying to follow how everything fits together, there are a number of mini application examples. Um, like um, these are located in the examples directory, and and um, they they include some uh, uh, fairly common uh, stencil-based codes like the Jacobi algorithm. Um, so these really help clarify a little bit what the basic what the bare bone functionality is, uh, and they cover a few different usage scenarios, but not in all different combinations because there's a lot of flexibility with regards to using, as I said, MPI or, or HBX or, or CUDA, and also with regards to how you initialize, whether you're running in serial, serial or whether you're running in, in parallel. And so these mini application examples, um, although they help, they only cover, cover a limited uh, set of, of usage scenarios and a, limited, uh, and a limited subset of the functionalities within the library. And really what, what I'd say is that, um, what I found is that if you if you do want to port your application and your application is tr trying to do anything that that differs even slightly from the mini applications examples, then quite quickly it requires uh, really understanding quite a bit more of the underlying um, way that um, the various layers of of, uh, of libgeodcom fit together in order to be able to make it work. And this applies in particular to the um, to the MPI type maps and where these are. Uh, registered and, and and where they are um, obtained from because it's not not necessarily always always consistent so um, another aspect of, of coming to using libgeodcomp is that this this MPI type map generator so its existence the existence of those scripts that I mentioned that are included to generate custom type maps as well as the fact that this is actually um, a critical part of making uh, the MPI parallel um, initializers and simulators work is not at all obvious from the outset. Um, so there's a there's a kind of quite a, quite a steep uh, learning and discoverability curve uh, there for an application developer. Uh, and in fact, there are um, encounters some some erroneous type map generation for um, enums, which are important, uh, including in the mini examples, in the mini application examples. 
um, so there was just, just an error somewhere in the script, which meant that the custom API type map generated didn't work. So there you know, it was necessary to find a workaround to this. So um, another aspect that I uh, encountered was that um, there, is, there is one example in the mini applications of an example where there is uh, the simulation is initialized based on some input data. But most of the examples really only work with um, um, synthetic data that's initialized uh, from scratch within the source code rather than reading, uh, um, certainly not reading large amounts of uh, input data as we want to do with Hail Caesar. Uh, reading our topographic data and actually also our ultimately our, our, um, our rainfall uh, input data. So it's not not straightforward to understand how to efficiently do that, namely to how efficiently read in and initialize a parallel simulation in particular with real real elevation data. So one possibility is that rank uh, actually reads in the same the entire same elevation file and then just picks up the bit that it needs for to fill in to initialize its particular subgrid. subgrid. But you can quickly see that for large numbers of ranks, this will hit the file system very hard um, uh, due to serialization on this single file, which will bottleneck, uh, throttle the application quite strongly. So if we want to run this at scale, we really that's we, we can't really do that. It's not right. And we need to work on it. So one solution that I found, and um, this is something that is useful to know about if, if you're ever wanting to use libgeo.com for your own stencil code, is that you could, well, one approach is that you can read in uh, your uh, data on rank zero and then it, and then use that to initialize the entire grid. Then use the MPI IO writer for snapshot, uh, check, checkpoint snapshot writing functionality to route the entire state of the system as an MPI IO uh, file. Um, then uh, initialize uh, a parallel and then in parallel, initialize the simulation by reading from disk, again, the MPI IO snapshot, snapshot, which will then cause each subgrid on each rank to be initialized independently in parallel um, with, with, uh, without serializing um, on, on the single file and, and, and without the file system not hitting the system too hard. So that's a solution that should work um, and should work at scale. So, um, so, uh, so results for the uh, for the for the scaling of um, uh, both well more sin more the realistic DM data rather than synthet synthetic test cases uh, on Archer uh, with varying uh, resolutions and sizes will follow in the ECC report uh, which will be available from, from the Archer website and uh, the uh, the libgeo.com port of Hail Caesar will be available on GitHub possibly linked to from uh, Declan Walter's uh, original Hail Caesar um, software uh, uh, description, uh, the link there, or uh, at the very least also from the Archer website. And it's worth noting that the simple synthetic test cases, which um, I showed uh, earlier to, to, to highlight how the flow routing algorithm, the list flood flow routing algorithm works, were not available in the original Hail Caesar, and they're quite useful. Um, both for the development process, that's that's essentially why I created them uh, as a debugging tool, um, so they can be used to uh, test and develop uh, the implementation of additional physics within the within the code, such as the erosion and sedimentation processes uh, to port those over from the original code. And um, also going forward for any kind of changes, it's a useful useful check. And also actually to give additional insight into the behavior of the list flood algorithm, both as a sanity check um, and just to show what happens with, with um, very, very particular well-controlled uh, terrain structures and um, rainfall climatic uh, conditions. So at the moment, actually, follow-on work is taking place uh, as part of a follow-on project um, following this initial port. And there, the the, the work is um, to to um, move on to the next bottleneck or, or key uh, um, blocker from really allowing this to, to be used more productively to do, to do the science, to do the landscape evolution modeling, namely to introduce parallel NetCDF-based I.O. within libgeodcomp, and thereby to make it available to do that within Hail Caesar. Because what that will allow us to do is it will allow, first of all, 
for initialization, it'll be a, um, a better solution than the one I, I um, mentioned as a workaround, because ultimately, with this increased amount of high-resolution data, we don't want to be working with um, these DEM, digital elevation model files, which are actually ASCII, right? So uh, the community is, is moving towards, more towards, as is common in a lot of earth sciences, NetCDF, uh, based um, data, which is useful because you know it's self-describing and it's amenable to to parallel I/O. So, so this is really the direction that we're moving in, and we're we're practically taking libgeo decomp in there by Hill Caesar in that direction to make it much easier to um, um, to, to to read in uh, large amounts of uh, topographic data. Um, so, we're doing that to enable the efficient ingest, um, and also. Uh, to do so not just um, at simulation outset, outset, but also interestingly to um, and to allow for the possibility to have uh, to to improve our short-term acute flood risk modeling forecasts by running ensemble simulations, where you um, run an ensemble si simulation with either uh, the same initial conditions or varying slightly varying initial conditions, and look at where uh, as you get live data in about the actual on the ground state of affairs with regards to flooding, you select the subset of your sim ensemble simulations which match most closely within a certain threshold, a certain area, key area, that real live data, and then extrapolate forward into time based purely on those. So you're refining your simulation in a sense. So it's a combination, and, and doing so with a certain frequency, uh, whatever frequency the data becomes available with from live sensors is in a sense steering uh, steering or to, yeah combining HPC with uh, with large amounts of data so it's quite an interesting interesting area and quite possibly quite quite promising area and novel area uh, as well as the ingest uh, of course we care about the output so we would like to efficiently out and periodically output uh, potentially quite um, large amounts of uh, time series information about quantities of interest. And as the resolution, as the linear resolution goes up, of course, we've got a um, square of this uh, as the amount um, of, of information. So, so that it can all grow very quickly. And we want to use parallel NetCDF to do that as well, to store this in, as NetCDF output from the simulation for further processing with lots of um, GIS um, um, Geographic information systems and other uh, earth science tools to really be much more interoperable with um, work on uh, with software for for uh, weather and climate forecasting, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a side effect of this is also that, as well, having been able to leverage the, the considerable um, development work that's gone into to, to creating libgeo comp, we can feed back into it and make this net parallel net, net CDFIO functionality available not just to Hill Caesar, but also to any other stencil code that's that's using libgeo comp. So it's a nice nice example hopefully of um, of improving the application, improving the HPC library as well, um, and uh, improving the science that the community can do as well as um, Making making benefiting the, the, making that software available for um, making some of the HPC more HPC specific um, an application uh, um, agnostic uh, library um, um, improving that as well. So that's uh, essentially what I wanted to describe about the the, the project. I see we have. Um, to participants, if, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. I might, I probably won't be able to add, uh, answer any of the science questions. Uh, it would need to be Declan or, or, or Simon who answers that. But I'm happy if anybody has any uh, questions to answer, to try and answer those. I think you can even you can type in the chat, um, or you can potentially un unmute yourself. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. Feel free to try if you want. But if um, if nobody has any questions, um, then uh, I hope you found this interesting, uh, potentially useful. And if you are doing research in this area, 
Um, I hope you will uh, pick up uh, the LibDuty Comport of Hill Caesar and play around with it uh, once it's available publicly and um, let's see if you can make it work. And uh, very happy to receive feedback um, and suggestions. So um, yes, thank you very much for, for attending and for listening.